Thanks again, everybody. Recording started. Well, everyone, good afternoon, good evening. For some of you here right now in our live studio, it's good morning uh, for today's Sunday special. Our love to the second power, it's a celebration in honor of Black History Month. We're going to be hearing today from three of our favorite poets, uh, Yeva Johnson, Martina McGowan, and Gary Lilly, and also them sharing their work, but sharing some of the work of some of their favorite poets. I've been, we decided it's February, the shortest month of the year, but why not double up on the love? So again, uh, welcome to all of you joining us here live in our Zoom poetry studio and those of you who may be out there watching on Facebook. I'm Sandy Unone, your host of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I wanna say, of course, thanks to Kim Ports Parsons and Don Krieger for always helping with the support of the programming. And we're so grateful to have this team to be able to bring you just remarkable poetry from our, from our uh, Cultivating Voices Live Poetry members. Uh, we're over well over 3,000, well over 3,000 strong after a few years. Well, we began, oh, now close to two years ago in response to the global pandemic and been bringing, bringing you the voices of poets from around, around the world since March 29th, 2020. Well, I could not be um, happier than to be able to uh, share the share this share the stage step back from the stage for us to be able to hear from our featured from our featured poets today uh i just respect all of their work so very much and i know that we will be hearing um just a very just a very profound and significant display of not only their own work which is significant in its own right, but um, the work of a poet that they've chosen to showcase um, with us. I would also just like to remind everybody, please keep your, your mics muted. The chat is also live. So send all the love. This is love to the second power. But, you know, so send the love. And also, uh, please do consider if you do not have the work of these fabulous poets, please do. Um, please do, please do, please do purchase one of or more of their collections. Well, I'm going to get us started here because I am not the attraction by any stretch of the imagination. Never am, never should be. Let me get out of the way uh, by introducing our first just just fabulous poet. I'm so I'm so grateful that Yeva Johnson was able to join us today. I met Yeva uh, many, many months ago 
on the collectibles reading series. And while I'm at it, let me um, give a shout out also to, uh, to uh, Mary Miriam of Headmistress Press uh, for, for the wonderful reading last, uh, you know, last week and uh, glad to be able to feature, um, to be able to say that I first met Yeva when uh, I was the host of the collectibles reading series put on with Headmistress Press, uh, Risa Denenberg and Mary Miriam. And it was always, always a joy to have Yeva in the audience and then to have Yeva join Cultivating Voices. And uh, it's, it's, it's always a revelation and a pleasure to um, be in the company of Yeva Johnson. A little bit of the, the biographical information for you all. Yeva Johnson is a Pushcart Prize nominated poet, musician, and physician whose work appears in the Bellingham Review, Essential Truths, the Bay Area in Color Anthology, Sinister Wisdom, Yamasi, and elsewhere. Yeva explores the interlocking caste systems and possibilities for human coexistence in our biosphere. She has a past Show Us Your Spines artist in residence from Radar Productions and the San Francisco Public Library, winner of the 2020 Mostly Water Art and Poetry Splash Contest. How's that for the name of a contest? I'd like, I'd, I'd like, to, I'd like to even be close to that one. As well as the poet in the uh, QT Pock for show a San Francisco Bay Area Artists Collective. Well, we are in for a, a powerful opening to our celebration of love to the second power, our celebration of Black History Month here on Cultivated Voices Live Poetry. Thank you, Yeva, and take it away. Thank you so much, Sandy. I am so thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be with Martina McGowan and Carrie Lilly. And um, I'm really grateful to be here today. So thank you, Sandy, and to Kim and to Dawn. I really, I just love coming here. I have to say it was a great challenge to select one Black poet who inspired me and uh, for this reading today. And you will see how hard it was for me. Um, and because I did not grow up reading Black lesbian poets, I chose two, Pat Parker and Audre Lorde, and will share some of their poems, as well as some of my own. Um, I'm really grateful to the Show Us Your Spines Artist in Residence program, because uh, sponsored by Radar Productions and, and the San Francisco Public Library, that gave me the opportunity to explore the works of these poets um, um, a little more thoroughly, and especially to Mason, who introduced me to Pat Parker. Um, choosing Pat Parker and Audre Lorde did not make my task any easier because they each have such a rich body of work that selecting a few poems from them was yet an additional challenge. I hope you enjoy. I'm going to keep my uh, banter to an absolute minimum from here. And I'll let you know, for those of you who haven't heard me read before, as with many of my readings, I play music together with the poetry. So I'll be starting and ending with music between poets. So we'll start with Pat Parker, then Audre Lorde, and then some of my poems will have music in between. Parker's to my vegetarian friend. It's not called soul food because it goes with music. 
It is a survival food from the grease sprang generations of my people, generations of slaves that ate the leavings of their masters and survived. And when I sit faced by chitlins and greens, neck bones and tails, it is a ritual. It is a joining me to my ancestors and your words ring untrue. This food is good for me. It replenishes my soul. So if you really can't stand to look at my food, can't stand to smell my food, and can't keep those feelings to yourself, do us both a favor and stay home. This is metamorphosis. You take these fingers, bid them soft, a velvet touch to your loins. You take these arms, bid them pliant, a warm cocoon to shield you. You take this shell, bid it full, a sensual cup to lay with you. You take this voice, bid it sing, an uncaged bird to warble your praise. You take me, love, a sea skeleton, fill me with you, and I become pregnant with love, give birth to revolution. And this is reputation. Has anyone ever wondered as I wonder why Fred Astaire is hailed as the greatest dancer in cinema history. I've watched him spin, twirl, even tap across the screen with Ginger Rogers. And each time I see them do the same dance, dance the same steps, I can't help but notice she's the one doing it in high heels. And this last poem of Pat Parker, I'm, it's a long poem, but I just, it's so apropos for today. So I'm just gonna do the first section. So just part of the poem and it's called For Audrey. One, the black unicorn is restless. The black unicorn is unrelenting. The black unicorn is not free. The black unicorn. Who is this bitch? I mean, really, who is this bitch? She come bopping into my life, bold. I be sitting in my pad, minding my own business. She come waltzing in, a funnel of energy, fire questions at me like some 60 minutes reporter hot and the bad guy. Like, where is she from? I know literally how she got here. Been hanging around with East Bay dykes and wants to know where the black women are. And to them, I am the black women. Now this woman sits in my house, reads, no, devours my words, no comment. Just clicking and uh -huhing, then has the nerve to say, I write good, but not enough. Push more, take the harder road. I know her for all of an hour and a half, and she's talking at me like my fifth grade teacher. More discipline, Patricia, stretch yourself. I mean, really, this be one bold ass bitch. If it's not enough, she ends the visit if that's what you call it. I'd call it an earthquake. Shake everything that isn't nailed down loose. Watch it crumble and fall. She tells me to my face as she goes out my door, you need to get rid of your lover. She no help to you. Who is this bitch?
now we're going to move on to Audrey Lord. And we will start. with a short poem called Now. Woman power is black power, is human power, is always feeling my heart beats as my eyes open, as my hands move, as my mouth speaks. I am, are you ready? And this is to the poet who happens to be black and the black poet who happens to be a woman. One, I was born in the gut of blackness from between my mother's particular thighs. Her waters broke upon blue flowered linoleum and turned to slush in the Harlem cold. 10 p.m. on a full moon's night, my head crested round as a clock. You were so dark, my mother said. I thought you were a boy. Two, the first time I touched my sister alive, I was sure the earth took note, but we were not new. False skin peeled off like gloves of fire yoked flame. I was stripped to the tips of my fingers, her song written into my palms, my nostrils, my belly. Welcome home in a language I was pleased to relearn. Three, no cold spirit ever strolled through my bones on the corner of Amsterdam Avenue. No dog mistook me for a bench nor a tree nor a bone. No lover envisioned my plump brown arms as wings, nor misnamed me condor, but I can recall without counting eyes canceling me out like an unpleasant appointment, postage due, stamped in yellow, red, purple, any color except black and choice and woman and alive. Four, I cannot recall the words of my first poem, but I remember a promise I made my pen never to leave it lying in somebody else's blood. This poem, this next poem, here we go is is um from the house of imanja my mother had two faces and a frying pot where she cooked up her daughters into girls before she fixed our dinner my mother had two faces and a broken pot where she hid out a perfect daughter who was not me I am the sun and moon and forever hungry for her eyes. I bear two women upon my back, one dark and rich and hidden in the ivory hungers of the other mother, pale as a witch, yet steady and familiar, brings me bread and terror in my sleep. Her breasts are huge, exciting anchors in the midnight storm. All this has been before in my mother's bed. Time has no sense. I have no brothers and my sisters are cruel. Mother, I need, mother, I need, mother, I need your blackness now as the August earth needs rain. I am the sun and moon and forever hungry, the sharpened edge where day and night shall meet and not be one. And this is going to be the last poem from Audre Lorde for today from me. And it's called, um, and I think you'll see why, why I picked this one to be the last one, The Night Blooming Jasmine. Lady of the night, 
star breathed blooms along the sea road between my house and the tasks before me calls down a flute carved from the leg bone of a gull. Through the core of me, a fine rigged wire upon which pain will not falter nor predict. I was no stranger in this arena at high noon. Beyond was not an enemy to be avoided, but a challenge against which my neck grew strong, against which my metal struck and I rang like fire in the sun. I still patrol that line, sword drawn, lighting red glazed candles of petition along the scar. The surest way of knowing death is a fractured border through the center of my days. Bees seek their need until flowers beckon beyond the limit of their wings. Then they drop where they fly, pollen baskets laden, the sweet work done. They do not know the lady of the night blossom between my house and the sea road, calling down a flute carved from the leg bone of a gull, your rich voice riding the shadows of conquering air. Now I will share with you some of my poems. And I hope someday, I do not have a book yet, but someday when I do, if you hear of it, please buy that book. But it hasn't come into the world yet. So enjoy. This uh, first poem of mine is called Poetic Sisters. Her last poem slips away. My fingertips close the book of complete works and I miss her. I yearn for her despite not yet having put her book in its rightful place on my shelf. So when I turn to my other sister outsider, I can't yet give myself up to Audrey because Pat Parker beckons me still with her innards. As I had to with June Jordan, I learn that I must live without her. All that's left are Pat's pages. After I recover my more even keeled black lesbian mother pacifist Jewish feminist physician self, then I can drink Audrey in. Drink deep but slow, like sampling a fine wine. Lord caught me up completely in the poem for Martha. I'm hooked, sinking and swimming, reading and rejoicing and mourning simultaneously. Oh, sister outsiders, would that I had seen you alive. And this next poem is called Bringer of Life and has an epigram with gratitude to Otis Redding and Anastasia Renee. The daughter of these three powerful mothers would never lack for adventure. It was just about half past nine and they were sitting by the dock of the bay, Ia Manja and Octavia Butler's fledgling herself when the azure waters swelled up and their female offspring plopped on the copper sand, gasping for breath crawling and clawing her way into the world. She was no Athena, just the child of the black Venus of Willendorf. She was no Athena, crawling and clawing her way into the world about half past nine when she spied Octavia's butler's fledgling, 
flirting at the water's edge with Iamaja. She was gasping for breath and was so in awe, dipping and diving her way through the world. She was no Athena, more like a diasporic African water woman on life's adventure and the daughter of these three powerful mothers. And the last poem I'm going to do, I um, uh, will thank Cultivating Voices Live Poetry because I made this poem for today. And you will see why. And then we'll have a little music and I'll be done. And it's called, It Takes a Village to Support an Emerging Black Poet. With an epigram that says, With Modified Gratitude Centros. When asked to pick a black poet, I chose two, Audrey Lord and Pat Parker. But then I thought, what about Lucille Clifton or Gwendolyn Brooks or James Baldwin or June Jordan or so many before and since? I know it takes a village to support an emerging black poet. These greats had passed on, one I'd met, heard her read, but many live today to help illuminate a black poet's path. Picture the village I see filled with black poets, women poets, Asian poets, older poets, queer poets, lesbian poets, Jewish poets, eco poets, Latinx poets, native poets, youth poets, trans poets, music poets, non-binary poets, artist poets, and even more poets, an infinite village. Come, meet some poets of African descent who reside in my poetry library in celebration this February. Alan Peliat Lopez, Amber Flora Thomas, Arissa White, Brittany Black Rose Capri, Camille T. Dungy, Claudia Rankin, Dana Smith, Dazier Grego Sykes, Douglas Kearney, Eve L. Ewing, Evie Shockley. To love and mourn in the age of displacement means this black queer hoe and a contingent of black faggotry. Yes, each a citizen. Look it up in the book of Buck studies. Don't call us dead because even without a knife or a semi-automatic, we fierce poets use our tongues to navigate the red channel in the rupture. Ignite this trophic cascade so at last we climb electric arches and grasp the black pearl. Griselle Yolanda Acosta, James Cagney, Jericho Brown, John Murillo, Joyce E. Young, Major Jackson, Marilyn Nelson, Mason J., M.K. Chavez, Morgan Parker, how I discovered poetry, contemporary American poetry, you know I had to roll deep. I may never be able to explain the tradition or how it happens, but it's not just the crossbones on my life that became necessary things to pack on the way to everywhere. Watch, at, watch my mother morphosis. Watch this magical Negro dance like black steel magnolias in the hour of chaos theory. Nazila Jameson, Norm Maddox, Pamela Sneed, Patricia Smith, Raina J. Leon, Rita Dove, Robin Cost Lewis, Terence Hayes, Thea Matthews, Tarita McKell, Vernon Keed III. A profeta without refuge gathers American sonnets for my past and future assassin to unearth the flowers on the voyage of the sable Venus. This funeral diva uses her evolutionary heart to transform collected poems using black calculus to create incendiary art. 
her southern migrant mixtape listen again and again is called synchronicity the oracle of sun medicine <laughs> Oh, could we have 20 more minutes? <laughs> yeah, well, that was like perfect opening. Every, every, every moment, the music, the, 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 the poems of Pat Parker and Audre Lorde in, you know, and because they were, because they were contemporaries and in conversation with each other so very much and and because we know that they have they have they have sparked generation you know the the next generations of of, of not only black poets but lesbian feminist poets um and and all the you know and all the intersections that that they shared that that both of them spoke and write about and you are right there in the tradition um, with them. And also I want to just say um, thank you. Thank you for your final poem. Uh, you know, I, because I was, and I'll talk about this a, a little more when we, when, when you all have your conversation together uh, after, after we hear from Gary, um, and Martina, you know, I think so much of the power of hearing names and in the Black Lives Matter, the say their names, which is in, has been invoked to um, name the names of, of those particularly young black men but of course, women as well, and and folks who are um, on the spectrum of of it's not just you know of 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 gender. Uh, so many trans folks lost. Um, we often invoke the names in grief, but today we got to invoke the names in joy and in celebration and in honor, respect. So uh, thank you for that reminder that um, we need the, the, we, the power of names is in, is in, is in the totality of how we can use the names and all I also was thinking of there's I, you know that I couldn't help but start thinking of my own names that I would add to the list like Nikki Giovanni and Nikki Finney and you know on and on and on and on and on um and uh, here I am sitting here in Connecticut uh which uh Marilyn Nelson was poet laureate of Connecticut so it was just great to have you you know, in, invoke those sisters who were outsiders, but now um, through your work and any of our ability to say their names um, gives them, uh, allows, holds the space for, holds, helps hold the space for their power, helps hold the space for their power so that they do not always remain the outsiders. Um, although there is power to that 
there is power to that role as well. So we'll talk about that a little. We'll talk about that a little later. Thank you, Yeva. Just and of course, we all can't wait for your book. <laughs> uh, you know, if you want one, you know, not everybody has to have a book. I don't. I don't push that on people. So again, all my gratitude. Whew. Well, that gave us love to the nth power, didn't it, Kim? Woo! And we continue. Uh, our next poet, uh, from the very first time I heard Martina McGowan read, uh, I was equally astounded just astounded by the power of her work that spoke and speaks truth to power, uh, not only in our contemporary, for our contemporary times, but in connection with the history that those, that our contemporary times have emerged from. And we were very fortunate to uh, be listening and sharing poetry with Martina bef before uh, or as folks were catching on to the significance of her collection, I Am the Rage. Uh, uh, you know, we knew before, we were hearing it before um, the folks that were giving it the accolades that it truly, truly uh, deserved. And I'm very, very grateful that, uh, uh, not only grateful for the poetry, but I'm grateful for the kinship and community ship that Martina has bestowed upon and, and brought to, to our group here, Cultivating Voices. We're very, very fortunate um, to have been able to share um, the journey with you. And when I thought about, when we thought about celebration, thought I cannot have a celebration without celebrating um, and supporting uh, Martina. So a little bit more, the bio, the formal bio for you all. Martina McGowan is also a physician, two doctors here today, <laughs> yes. A physician, poet, writer, artist, advocate, activist in the wars against social, racial, and sexual injustices. You've heard her poetry. If you've heard poetry, you know all these to be true uh, from the pages and from her voice. She is the author of I Am the Rage, published by Source Books in 2021. And as I mentioned, I Am the Rage was, uh, has been awarded numerous accolades, including the 2021 International Book Award winner in the social change category. The book was also an honorable mention Book Royal Dragonfly Award in 2021 and a Goodreads Choice Award nominee. Martina is the poetry editor for the elevator, the elevation, the elevator, the elevation review magazine. And her work has been published in numerous literary magazines and anthologies sh and shared internationally, which she also shares of herself internationally, uh, attends uh, lots of poetry readings in support of so many poets. Um, it's always uh, just always my pleasure to be in her company and I'm 
very glad to be celebrating, uh, have, have you part of the celebration today and, and looking forward to hearing your work and your poet's work. Thank you, Martina. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Kim and Don and everybody else behind the scenes. And those of you who've come to share, uh, Yeva is an almost impossible act to follow, but I will <laughs> do my best. And a funny thing, you know, we're both physicians. I, I also used to play flute. I may have to pick that up again. <laughs> Small world. I'm, I'm going to screen share, uh, if I can get this rolling. Um, as Yeva has already said, there were almost too many poets to choose from. Um, I chose Lucille Clifton. Lucille was born in Depew, New York, grew up in Buffalo. She studied at Howard University and transferred to SUNY Fredonia, which was near her hometown. She was discovered by poet Ishmael Reed, who shared her work with Langston Hughes, who then published her in his anthology, The Poetry of the Negro in 1970. Lucille's work emphasizes endurance and strength through adversity, focusing particularly on African-American experience and family life. In the book, All Us Come Cross the Water, she created context to raise awareness of African-American history and heritage. She is the first author to have had two books at the same time up for finalists as Pulitzer Prize, Good Woman and Next. Her Collection Two-Headed Woman was also a Pulitzer nominee. She served as a poet laureate of Maryland from 1974 to 1985. She was distinguished professor of humanities at St. Mary's College of Maryland and a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. She's noted to, for writing physically small poems with enormous and profound inner worlds, something I'm working on learning from her. The heroes of many of her pieces include nameless slaves buried on old plantations, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Hector Pearson, the first child killed in the Soweto riots, Fannie Lou Hamer, founder of the Mississippi Peace and Freedom Party, Nelson and Win Winnie Mandela, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Huey P. Newton, as well as many others who gave their lives to free Black people from slavery and prejudice. Lucille's Clif Lucille Clifton's 1993 poetry collection, The Book of Light, also contained poems on bigotry and intolerance, destruction with a particularly moving poem on the tragic bombing and loss of life of the MOVE compound in Philadelphia in 1985, and if you've not read it, you should. Religion and mythology, which he couches in figures like Atlas and Superman, one of which I'll be reading. In this collection, she also deals with her own breast cancer, juvenile violence, child abuse, dreams, the legacy left behind of slavery, empathy with animals, in particular foxes, squirrels, and crabs. And she probes the narratives that undergird Western civilization and asks us to forge new ones. In addition to her numerous poetry collections, she also wrote children's books. Uh, these were designed to help children understand their world and their African-American heritage. Her main character is Everett Anderson, an African-American boy living in a big city. Um, her eighth book, Everett, Everett Anderson's Goodbye in 1984, won the Coretta Scott King Award. She died in 2010 in Baltimore. In 1980, Lucille Clifton lost her house in foreclosure. This has been the fate of many Black families in America losing their homes to eviction, foreclosure, and the structural violence of redlining and gentrification. In 2021, her six children bought it back and it now serves as an artist retreat. I'll finish this section with two quotes. I don't write out of what I know. I write out of what I wonder. I think most artists create art in order to explore, not to give the answers. Poetry and art are not about answers to me. They are about questions. I come to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's the end of this section. Now I will read some of Lucille's poems. Harriet, if I be you, let me not forget to be the pistol pointed, to be the mad woman at the river's edge warning be free or die. 
And Isabel, if I be you, let me in my sojourning not forget to ask my brothers, ain't I a woman too? And grandmother, if I be you, let me not forget to work hard, trust the gods, love my children, and wait. Final note to Clark. They had it wrong, the old comics. You are only Clark Kent after all. Oh, mild-mannered mister, why did I think you could fix it? How you must have wondered to see me taking chances, dancing on the edges of words, pointing out the bad guys, dreaming your x-ray vision could see the beauty in me. What did I expect? What did I hope for? We are who we are to faithful readers, not Wonder Woman and not Superman. The next is Blessing the Boats, which I'm sure many of you have heard. Um, it's written at St. Mary's where she was chancellor. Uh, for some, and I've read many accounts of what people think this, poet, this poem is about. Um, St. Mary's was actually a slave boat landing. Um, her blessed, I think she is indeed blessing the boats like St. Mary's port itself uh, had many names of religious icons and other connotations. Um, but I think she was obviously blessing the people, the, the new slaves who had just debarked from the boat. So blessing the boats at St. Mary's. May the tide that is entering even now, the lips of our understanding carry you out beyond the face of fear. May you kiss the wind, then turn from it, certain it will love your back. May you open your eyes to water, water waving forever. And may you in your innocence sail through this to that. And probably one of her most famous pieces, Won't You Celebrate With Me. Won't you celebrate with me what I had to shape a kind of life I had no model, born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. And now I'll read a few of my own based on hers. This first is a uh, uh, litany of fear and loss um, with lines taken from several poems by Aud Audre Lorde, Lucille Clifton, Maya Angelou, Mahogany Brown, Etheridge Knight, and a little, a little bit of Elizabeth Bishop. The art of losing isn't hard to master. For those of us who cannot indulge memory of old tombs, looking inward and outward, remembering love will vanish. Anger rots the oak and elm, roses are rare. So it is better to speak this illusion of some safety found. Our words will not be heard above the din and dam. The night is full of lost keys, the hour badly spent. Standing upon the constant edges of decision, I am accused of tending to the past remembering faces, names, and dates, history, seeking a noun that can breathe the passing dreams of choice futures. Today, I am a black woman in America, lines along my face as if I sculpted it of buggers and bastards, no moon or stars. Veins collapse, opening like the lips of our understanding, moving through our word countries, so many things seem filled with the intent. I will ask the angels of a creative God to lessen the blows because I love to live beyond the face of fear. The art of losing isn't hard to master. We were never meant to survive. Get a quick drink here. Uh, a sweeter song I've read here before, <clears throat> excuse me. You ask for sweeter songs, better rhymes and lighter melodies, but my poor heart cannot comply for the truth is all we have on offer. 
Promises of light-filled days remain empty, lasting happiness in short supply islands of joy, contentment, sinking in seas of setbacks. I too dream of fresh breezes caressing my face, walking white sands, chasing waves, wallowing in wildflower fields, toes dipping carelessly into cool creeks, basking in moonlight beneath a blanket of stars, awaiting the opening of asylum doors, co-signing my sluggish freedom, anxious to release the sorrow, the heartache, and watch them float away. Some other day, I shall sing to you of peace and love and hope. Some other day, I shall write of beauty and nature, but not this day. Today, I am but a canary, caught in life's coal mine, inhaling double doses of air so that you may breathe. And I think this, I will make this my final one. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Who I'm from. <clears throat> I am from the gates of no return and barracoons, a 13 day journey, thirst unslaked, chained in darkness, a sprig of heather added to my genes. I'm from the sticky, sweet sap of stout pines, barbed and prickly cotton bushes, all flesh, timber, and balls sold at auction. Neglected slave quarters turned into homes. I am from Lucretia, a six foot pipe smoking wonder, her father, a freed slave. Abused fingers fashioning biscuits almost too sweet to eat and sweet potato turnovers from scraps. I am from red clay pounded into concrete, hard streets and even harder women doling out wisdom hard won and life lessons, love buried deep within like a diamond. I am of the redeemed and the lost, tempted and tried oft, made to wonder, prayers the fabric holding us together, trying to ward off danger. I am from crossing hot, sticky rooftops and yoo-hoos and orange knee highs, marbles, stickball and bailing out of swings before I knew I was prey. Tiny apartments filled with family and sweet aromas of home food, circle blessing big enough to hold Jesus wept being said more than once. My eyes smiling, side rolling, waiting for someone else to say he sure did. Risking a finger pluck from an aunt and the death stare from my mother. <clears throat> Fathers who adored but drank too much, crushed beneath the weight and weariness. Brothers who loved too many, uncles who molested those they did not love, women who stood against the tide. I am from people knowing only one form of punishment pushed their children's hearts away in hopes of saving them from corruption. I am from people who rose from little, who continue to dream for the sake of their children, of a world better than they inherited. Now surrounded by dusty boxes of photographs, an anchor, an articulation point of six generations holding one long breath, digitizing hopes and aspirations so that all might see that there is so much love and joy inside our pain. Thank you. Oh, sometimes that mute button doesn't want to <laughs> unmute. Martina, thank you. Thank you for your contribution, your voice, and also bringing, bringing in the voice of the grand Lucille Clifton. I remember when, um, I remember reading the story about her of, about her family creating the residence um the writer's resident residence and being um so 
so struck and so moved by the the fact that you know here is a Pulitzer Prize winning poet who um, had you know who is anchored so much um, nationally and internationally in poetry and still because of structural racism is caught you know is caught in the um, is caught in that 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 total trap of economics and history and even her even her words couldn't change that outcome and and all the things that her words did evoke and and bring forth so that both things like like not shockingly were true at the same time. Just as you say, that joy, you know, lives within the the, the pain of grief. Like it, it is going on simultaneously. Um, thank you for that work. Um, thank you. To bring those messages forward today. And ev- and you do it every day. So it's not just today, but it's but it's it's some other day which is every day that you do that work um, with your poetry. And we'll come back and talk a little bit more about um, the work after we hear from our next poet, which is, again, uh, a person that, uh, a poet that I have such immense respect for. You all have, had the pleasure of of knowing Gary Lilly's work, whether through cultivating voices or uh, or of your own accord. Um, but of course, I'm very, very grateful uh, to to have been able to hear Gary on our program a number of times as well, because his, his, his work is so evocative and provocative. And we will get into all of that when we get into the conversation. Um, but for now, uh, let me just preview Gary's reading with uh, thanks, with gratitude for, um, for his remarkable voice and the remarkable poems that you're about to hear. Well, Gary Copeland Lilly is the author of eight books of poetry and the most recent, and we've heard poems from this collection here on Cultivating Voices, live poetry, The Bushman's Medicine Show from one of our favorite presses here, Lost Horse Press in 2017, as well as a chap, the chapbook, The Hog Killing from Blue Horse Press in 2018. Gary earned his MFA from the Warren Wilson College Program for Creative Writing and is a veteran of the US Navy's nuclear submarine force. He's originally from North Carolina and now lives, writes, performs, and teaches in the Pacific Northwest. He's received the Washington DC Commission on the Arts Fellowship for Poetry and is a founding member of the Black Rooster Poetry Collective. He's also published in scores and scores of anthologies and journals. He was a finalist for the 2018 and 2020 Washington State Poet Laureate. One of these days, the state will (laughs) get its act together. (laughs) He is a Cave Conum Fellow and the artistic curator of the Port Townsend Writers Conference. And if you've if you never if you've never had the chance to attend the, the conference, um, please do. There's always there's uh, often a session. Uh, I had the pleasure of seeing a session that he and Kim Adenizio were holding um, with their students, basing uh, their poetry uh, 
in the improvisation of jazz. And uh, it was an incredible, incredible reading. Gary always brings the, you know, the most evocative work to any stage um, that he stands upon uh, or is in a screen. And I have no doubt that we will experience the same today. Thanks, Gary. And it's really great to be with you today. Thank you. Hey, it was hard getting here, but I'm here and I'm glad to be here as always, every time I get a chance to, to be. And I'm going to thank my, my other readers here, man. You guys are rocking. I mean, really, Yeva and Martina, you always do this thing, you know. So, what you know how appreciative I am to be working, um, reading poems with you guys, and to, and and to to hear the poems of Audre Lorde, to hear the poems of Lucille Clifton. Lucille Clifton is like a major, major influence with me and stuff, you know, just from what she does and stuff, you know. She what she does on one page is killer, you know, really. <laughs> But anyway, um, music has been such a part of, of like what I do and stuff that I, I, I do sometimes put my poems to music and stuff. And that's why, yeah, but I'm glad that you are here today. I'm going to, this is one that, that I kind of put together a little while back. Guys, hearing that okay? Ghost of the lower night ward long. Efrit Knight is from Mississippi. 
and like he is like he's awesome. He does so many. There are so many of us who who he was like the uh, the uh, savior grace. You know, when you look at Esther's night and and his whole history, the of Korean War vet, uh, he comes back. He's been injured, but while he was over there. Um, he is being treated with morphine. He, he comes back to the country, and there is that's no that's not good anymore. And so he ends up. We know about um, mass in, incarceration. He he ends up in prison, and he's he's pulling this time for a robbery for these drugs. I think he broke into like a, a doctor's office for those drugs, you know. And so he does this, he felt like he had been given too much time for the crime that he's done. And he starts writing from that anger. And like, um, he becomes a major pillar in the black arts movement, which is like, uh, when we look at the black arts movement, the black arts movement is the, is the, the artistic wing of the black power movement. That's what it was. You know, and their and their philosophy was the same as the Harlem Renaissance that everything we do will speak to our own community, and then the language we use will be the language that we use in our communities, and that the the rhythms that you hear in our poems will be the rhythms that are in the music of our community, and that's 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 where he starts from. The Black Arts Movement. We're paying homage to to the to the Black Power Movement with that. The whole civil rights thing that that he was involved in, being from Mississippi, and then uh, we're looking at Malcolm, at the death of Malcolm, and uh, we're looking at uh, at the at, at the beginning of the Black Panther Party and stuff. So we're looking at a time of revolution and stuff. And but we're dealing with this man. Empress Knight, Empress Knight. And I'm gonna read a few of his poems um, to, to, today. Uh, cell song, night, music, slanted light, strike the cave of sleep. I alone tread the red circle and twist the space with speech. Come now, Efforts. Don't be a savior. Take your words and scrape the sky. Shake rain on the desert. Sprinkle salt on the tail of a girl. Can there be anything good come out of prison? And this is the one that I love of his, uh, the, the idea of ancestry. I've taught in a lot of different places. Um, like you know, in the community, in like um, um, hospitals and rehabilitation centers and in, and in correctional units and stuff. So, and this is the poem that gets them all and stuff. The idea of ancestry. One, take to the wall of my cell of 47 pictures, 47 black faces, my mother, father, grandmothers, one dead. Grandfathers, both dead. Brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, cousins, first and second. Nieces and nephews, they stare across the space at me sprawling on my bunk. I know their dark eyes, they know mine. I know their style. They know mine. I am all of them. They are all of me. They are farmers. I am a thief. I am me and they are thee. I have at one time or another been in love with my mother, one grandmother, two sisters, two aunts. One went to the asylum and five cousins. I am now in love with a 17 year old niece. She sent me letters written in large block print, and her picture is the only one that smiles at me. I have the same name as one grandfather, three cousins, three nephews, and one uncle. 
The uncle disappeared when he was 15 and just took off and caught a freight, they say. He dis he's discussed each year when the family has a reunion. He causes uneasiness in the clan. He is an empty space. My father's mother, who is 93 and who keeps the family Bible with everybody's birth dates and death dates in it, always mentions him. There is no place in her Bible for whereabouts unknown. Two. Each fall, the grays of my grandfathers call me. The brown hills and red gullies of Mississippi send out their electric messages, galvanizing my genes last year like a salmon, quitting the cold ocean, leaping and bucking up his birth stream. I hitchhike my way from LA with 16 cats in my pocket and a monkey on my back. And I almost kicked it with the kin folks. I walk barefoot in my grandmother's backyard and I smell the old land and the woods. I sip corn whiskey from fruit jars with the men. I flirted with the women. I had a ball to the cats ran out and my habit came down. That night, I looked at my grandmother and split. My guts were screaming for junk, but I was almost contented. I had almost caught up with me. The next day in Memphis, I cracked a crocus crib for a fix. This year, there is a gray stone wall damming my stream, and when the falling leaves stir my jeans, I pace myself or flop on my bunk and stare at 47 black faces across the space. I am all of them. They are all of me. I am me and they are D. And I have no children to float in the space between. Yeah. Then uh, this is one he wrote for Langston Hughes. And Langston. See, Langston is the only person who, who bridged both the Harlem Renaissance and the Black Arts Movement. You know, he, he, he is the only writer. And you know what? And see, he wrote the manifesto. He wrote that, um, you know, free within ourselves, the, the, uh, the Negro artist and the racial mountain, which set the criteria for what both of these groups in their different time periods believed in. You know, so he's paying homage to to Langston, and the poem is for Langston Hughes. Gone, gone. Another weaver of black dreams has gone. We sat in June box pad with shades drawn, and the air thick with holy smoke, and we heard the ladies sing Langston before we knew his name. And when black bodies stopped swinging June, but TG and I went out and swung on some white cats. Now I don't think the myth maker meant for us to do that, but we didn't know what else to do. Gone, gone. Another weaver of black dreams has gone. And uh, in the spirit of Langston Hughes, you know, he wrote this, this blues and stuff. And so I think this is kind of like a, like a homage to Langston Hughes too, a poem for my, a poem for myself, for blues or blues for a Mississippi black boy. I was born in Mississippi. I walked barefoot through the mud, born black in Mississippi walk barefoot through the mud. But when I reached the age of 12, I left that place for good. Said my daddy chopped cotton and he drank his liquor straight. When I left that Sunday morning, he was leaning on the barnyard gate. Left her standing in the yard, the sun shining in his eyes. As I headed for north as straight as the wild goose flies. I've been to Detroit and Chicago, been to New York City too. 
I've been to Detroit and Chicago, I've been to New York City too. Said I done strolled in all those funky avenues. I'm still the same old black boy with the same old blues. Going back to Mississippi, this time to stay for good. Going back to Mississippi, this time to stay for good. Gonna be free in Mississippi or dead in the Mississippi mud. Um, for Malcolm a year after. Compose for red a proper verse, adhere to foot and strip I am. Control the burst of angry words, or they might boil and break the dam. Or they might boil and overflow and drench me, drown me, drive me mad. So swear no oath, so shed no tear, and sing no song, blue Baptist sad. Evoke no image, steer no flame, and spin no yard across the air. Make empty Anglo tea lace words. Make them dead white and dry bone bare. Compose a verse for Malcolm, man, and make it rhyme and make it prim. The verse will die as all men do, but not the memory of him. Death might come singing sweet like sea, or knocking like the old folks say. The moon and stars may pass away, but not the anger of that day. And I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna read a few of mine and now be done. <laughs> the preparatory fire for the hog. These are from the hog killer. I'm gonna read it now. The preparatory fire for the hog. The air is sharp, colder than the shallow river that has started to freeze. A thin pane of ice growing just off the banks. The first week of January when the ground is hard and the woods, a shame of naked trees scattered among the evergreens. Deer beds in the tall brown grass on the other side of the pig pen fence. The enclosed grub field that doesn't have a root blade of grass or a weed and the family in heavy coats and mud boots an array of sharpened knives and abundance of prayer, the early morning work of harvesting pork. A 12-year-old boy hauls firewood to the steel trough where he will heat the water to scald the dead hog. The choices for the pistol and the knife. The men have gathered around the thick steel rod at the end of the trough where the fire has been built. And as usual, someone has a pint of shine and it is passed around as they look over the hogs all gathered in the far corner of the pen. You can see the last breaths of every chosen animal. And every man, woman, and child has a job to do the day promises to be as cold and hard as the ground they are standing on. And everything's all right because having enough food can keep you from feeling like you're poor. Every man wiping his mouth knows that, knows how to deal with hunger that comes in a child belly. So two of the older boys are chosen. The one with the almost mustache, and the tall one home from the army, they will kill the hogs. The old Marys, don't you weep. The five married women are in the kitchen, skillet cooking slices of fresh pork, which will be the sandwiches served for lunch with cold coca-colas they laugh and joke about their husbands to the other wives but no one talks about the husband 
by any husband but their own. That is their code. No mention of drunks, wife beaters, or, gam or gamblers, or ramblers. Never ever any mention of any other lover unless his name be Jesus. And the, the loudest woman is already working on the evening meal of some more fresh pork. Mock macaroni and cheese, string beans from the fall canning, pear preserves and scratch biscuits for dessert, coffee with sugar and cream, the kitchen window steaming from all that contain heat. And, and the last poem I'm gonna read is The Moonshiner's Wife at Church. She can't take another beating. Where are the deacons? There ain't nobody here willing to step into the liquor sanctuary of his home and put a stop to this shit. She knows she can't keep letting her boy see this. I can see the hurt in their faces, the deep ferals already in their brows. I could see them hating him. The young, they young now, but they already got that man funk and piss on their hands. And I know it won't be long before one of them steps to him. And I'm sorry, I don't think she want either of her boys in prison for killing their father. A drinking man is bad business in a family, but a drinking man with an endless supply of whiskey is the devil's con continuous flow of hell stench into the house. He blacked her eye before church service, then later got mad and beat her again because she went to the worship service without any makeup. Her boys, She's got to save them. She don't want either of them ever treating their wives like that. She gonna have to make him quit or kill him herself. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Folks, you just heard Gary Lilly, the poems from those last poems from the hog killing from Blue Horse Press. Um, I've gotten to hear them. I've gotten to hear you read them a number of times here on Cultivating Voices, but also when we used to be in person. And uh, right on, right on. they never, I know, they never, they never like, they just never cease to to just really take me. Um, so I'm thank you for thank you for sharing those particular poems thank you. today, Gary. And of course, um, sharing the sharing the legacy of 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 Etheridge Knight and that connection with and that connection with Langston Hughes, which brings um, connections to so many. Um, other poets as well in the Black Arts Movement and in the Harlem Renaissance, creating like that 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 bridge between the gener that bridge between the generations. Um, in the last couple minutes that we have today, um, I just I actually want to bring kind of all all three of you together. Um, and maybe we can spotlight uh, Yeva and Martina as well. And more, you don't need to hear anything from me. Um, uh, what I'd really like to hear, what I'd really like to ask is, you know, each of you, each of you shared from your very unique perspective and your, and your identities. We, I was talking about that in particular with, with Yeva. Um, but, but uh, or and we, you know, we heard in, you know, Audre Lorde and in Pat Parker, I am the black woman. And then Martina talking about, I am from. And 
I would just like to know in you listening to each other, what did you hear today? And I know I'm putting you a little on the spot, but as I said, um, because this is so much about, because you're, because everything you shared, all three of you was, was so much about legacy and history and carrying it forward. Um, and also sharing that love of music too, like that bridge. I, I, I'm just really curious what you heard in each other's work. Just the love of other poets, of other Black poets, and and like um, recognizing the contributions of of, of like you know these. Um, they're not even elder. They're because some of them are contemporary. They're with us now and stuff, right? So we're recognizing them because there is something that 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 binds us all. And so, and, and maybe that's the shared history, uh, 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 as well as the individual things that, uh, that we have and stuff. But there's definitely um, a shared history, especially a shared political history. Mm -hmm. I will say I was in communication with Martina a little bit before and knew that Lucille Clifton um was going to be uh one of the feature people so i and i at first i was so frustrated i was like one black poet like <laughs> i was really frustrated with that and that's why i'm like well i'm gonna get two you know but then <laughs> i put those two i was like but what about lucille clifton and then martina said I I like, okay, these people are all connected to that i i feel today really the connections resonate with um with as three as poets today, we've right read, we've never read before together, but also with the poets we selected because I have read as original. I've, I've, I anyway. I like I've heard those are some of my favorite poems from those poets that you all selected today, and then also this theme about the music. There's the music. There's the rhythm. There's the ancestors. There's the culture. There's the cuisine. There are all these things tying together. This is like a great, this is a great civilization that is shared with the world, this sort of diasporic thing. And I, and we are connecting the present with the past. And um, so I think it's, you know, I, I love the, the residence of the beauty of each person's your own when, when you read your own I, I've never read other poets poems more than one poem before in public, you know, so I, I'm not I'm not used to doing that. So it was just, it's really fun, right? It's bringing somebody it's bringing them back and then the subjects of all those poems like read as somebody my grandmother used to work with him back in Detroit back mm -hmm. in the day. So there are just so many resonances and some of the things are the themes in the poems. Also, I heard different things in different poems, you know, bird, the images, sounds, rhythms, themes, um, these themes of freedom and self-actualization and community and family and food and survival. So that's all I, I Gary, I, I really enjoy, I enjoyed this whole thing. And to know another flute playing uh, black position poet, okay, I, awesome, so. <laughs> if I feel, and I think people who have listened to any of us before, uh, feel seen and, and heard. Obviously we're connected through the diaspora, um, but I think until recent times, we haven't really shared that much as openly. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the cuisine, I mean, with, whether you're from, uh, you know, whether you live in, in England or, you know, the islands or South Carolina, you know, there are bits and pieces um, that all of our people retained. Um, so we remain connected, not just by skin color, but there's a underlying cultural connection between us. Um, and obviously some genetic connection as well. But um, I, I think that the more we speak about it, the more connected we all feel 
as, as well. And, and, and I think that that helps feed the, the writing. And, and I agree with Yeva, you know, Etheridge is, is one of my, my favorites. I just discovered him a couple of years ago. Uh, I was going to choose Audra, but Yeva had already taken her. So, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and how do you choose a favorite poet, you know? Really? Him, really? him and I were talking yeah. about that earlier, you know, it depends on the day, the mood, you know, and, and that would probably be true if you asked me to choose a, a hundred different poems, but but it, but it, it's the yeah. connection of, of their work and our work and each other's work. You know, I've heard Yeva and Gary both a couple of times, but it's usually one or two poems and, and it, it's nice to hear it in a, a broader context. Um, yeah, makes us feel seen and heard. Right on. Yeah, I was glad that you guys were reading what you were reading. I, I mean, it was just like, it just, uh, it made me feel, you know, full just to just to get that and stuff. You know, Audrey, Audrey Lord and Lucille Clifton and, you know, and, and there were shout outs, there were shout outs there, all, all, you know, with, with, with people that we all know are, are we seen, are we read? You know, and those shout outs were just moving to me because I was like, I was doing, oh yeah, him too, her too. You know, I was doing that all the, the whole time. And Yeva was just calling them up. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love that. Because you're right, you know, we, we, we say names usually after people are gone, but it, it's nice to have a few that we can say their names, you know, while they're yet alive. You know, and, and whether they're living or, or already gone on, they are our poetic ancestors. Uh, and often in readings, much to the annoyance of, of hosts, I, I always try to read at least one poem of, of one of my poetic forebears, um, because I think it's important. You know, we, we didn't just show up suddenly. Yeah, I think that, the, I, I mean, one of the things that I, when we just when we were thinking about the format for today is that you know we definitely wanted to 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 amplify that 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 you know each of us is part of a is part of a unique poetic le a poetic legacy or legacies right depending on depending on um, depending on which intersections of identities I'm choosing, I'm uh, choosing to amplify. And, you know, I was really, I was thinking about like what Gary, what you were saying about oh, that, that notion of being, of being kind of finally seen and heard and, and then thinking about Etheridge night poem or Etheridge's poem about the, 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 that line with the Bible and there's no place for where, whereabouts unknown. And, and that, that some of the poets that Yeva and each of you evoked were kind of right, were at a time writing in a vacuum until they could find those connections. Right. Right. And that was kind of a whereabouts, like unknown, like being um, and not being seen and not being heard or, or being just, or being only like the only poet, the only black right. poet, like that someone right. would know of. And um, I'm really curious that you each belong to your own communities of poets. And I mean, this is a community also, but but you, but your community around your around your identity, I mean, um, around your identities around race and you celebrate that. I mean, that's why we brought you here uh, today um, among other reasons. Can you talk a little bit more about those poetic communities and how they, mm. you know, how they anchor you within still, um, within still, um, 
you know, these these systems of racism that exist right. even within the artistic systems. Right. Um, Martina was right. It feels good to be to be heard, to be seen, and stuff. And I think back that was that that is the, the impetus for a organization like Cave Common and stuff. Right. So. So, so to get involved with them, and it's just like um, there was nowhere to go, you know, for for the African American poet. Um, how many of us have sat in workshops where we are the one, you know, really? And yeah. so, where our references that we kind of pull up our symbolism, nobody understands it, right? You know, so so it's to to be in a group of people who are who know what you're talking about and and and, and who know the work and they also get involved in you and they give you truths about your work mm -hmm. you know because it's all about it, it's not it's not competitive like that you know not you know not from my experience I haven't seen that so it was good to be involved it was good to be uh to be a, a member of Kaveh Khan, and I, I really do love the idea that I was able to to meet so many other writers, so many other African American writers, and like, and well, okay, just hearing Yeva read those names, there were so many of those people that I that I knew from Kaveh Khan to have some connection there, faculty or or they were fellows or like you know whatever. But they were, but they were there, they were there, and and that shows you the importance of of, of what happened 25 years ago, because this never existed. Yeah, like 25 years ago. I would follow up there, Gary, just to let you know that one. Convict, I came to poetry writing very late in life. Mm -hmm. So I've been applying to to get into Kaveh Khanum now is very difficult and I'm going to apply till the day I die. I hope I get to go someday. <laughs> but um, but the 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 poets that I I chose living poets because sometimes mm. sometimes um, you know, the poets that have gone on, we, we have we do remember them very well. And that's right. almost part of our tradition, too. And mm -hmm. then they become so large that the new, the, the ones who are live, like, well, like yeah. Lisa Clifton, I didn't hear about till after she died. And I'm from Maryland and I feel terrible about that. Mm. She was the poet laureate, but I never heard of the poet laureate of Maryland when I was in those younger days. But the those poets that I mentioned just happened to be, that those are my poetry books. The, and, and some of them I don't have. <laughs> The more famous people, I get them from the library. I have, you know, like many of us, there's a book problem. I have limited shelf. So if I can get it from the library, I can read more poets. But it means, but I do buy some poets. So those are my, those are the black poets that I have on my shelf who are alive. There's some other ones who aren't alive anymore, but because I have all of Lou Clips, New Seal Clifton's poems, but that's who I have. Some of them I know, some of them have taught me, some of them I don't know. Some people are fresh and new it's their first it's their first yeah. thing that ever got published i heard him and i bought it for him please buy this but selling out of the bag so it's a wonderful there are multiple communities and it's a wonderful thing to support mm -hmm. i think it's going to support living poets because uh you know to carry this on it's a it's wonderful yeah, I'm on the same list as uh, Yeva for Kaveh Khanum. <laughs> <So> <laughs> maybe we'll get there in the same time. <laughs> I was just, I'm right. happy to read with Gary, who was it? I meet a lot of hey, people. Hey, hey, it. it took me about like maybe like 15 years, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and granted, this is about Black History Month and African American poets, but, but I've also gotten more involved with other brown communities and, and uh, um, uh, Asian poets, uh, you know, because we're all caught up in the same kinds of uh, diasporic feelings. Uh, and it's nice to share those things with them as well. Um, yes. There are still so many similarities be between our lives, um, even though it, on the surface, it doesn't seem like our cultures connect, but, but, but underneath all that they, they do, do. They, they, are, they are the same. It's the same, the same pain and love and same agony and adversity and uh, you know, maybe a different, you know, different decade but it's the same, the same crap. Uh, and so it's nice to share it with, especially the other brown poets, um, mm -hmm. you know, because they're coming into their own as well. Um, you know, they, they, 
got so many poets that, that I am just discovering uh, and, and it's great. Yeah, I'm going to bring that up, Martina, because I also am in another community that's called the BIPOC Writing Community that sprung up during this pandemic and is on Zoom and is writers of color and um, is it's actually a global, there are people from all over the world coming up every Monday. It's, it's, it okay. saved me through okay. this pandemic. I'll jot that down. Fantastic. Mm. And it's just this writing, it's a generative prompts and it's mm -hmm. fun and it's, it is like mixed age group, all different kinds of people and it's an amazing thing and I, that's been keeping me going. So I do, I love that more like broadening and there are multiple poetic communities. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's very interesting to see who you see where so, but yeah, that one in particular in terms of I, there was a one for a little time that was all black poets. I've actually been to an all black poet thing, small here in the Bay Area on Zoom, but mm -hmm. it, it's not happening anymore, but it was cool. But some of the people come to the BIPOC writer community now, so. And, and another, another um, I'll just give another, I'll give a shout out to another group that I know that because it's, they've been going strong for a long time too, which is um, J.P. Howard and Cynthia Malnick's yeah. um, Women Writers Bloom. Um, which is Saturday, Saturdays. Um, mm. It's almost, it's not every month, but it's almost every month. Actually, and, their event is coming up this Saturday. Okay, mm -hmm. this, yeah, yeah. And, and what a great, what a great community out of, um, um, they're uh, out of um, Brooklyn and it's a terrific, terrific group. Um, I know a number of people here have <laughs> attended and, um, but JP and Cynthia have, uh, you know, been not only doing, uh, it's not only readings, but you have, there's actually community building within, within um, the session. Right. And, and actually you do some writing together as well, all over Zoom. So I uh, just want to give a shout out, um, a shout out there as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's another great group and 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 big shout out to of course to Cave Conum too. I mean, like when, um, when, which which has which crossed a major milestone. I mean that it's it's twenty you know it's twenty fifth anniversary and it's big celebration for for that. It's it's hard to it's hard for me, you know, sitting kind of from where I'm sitting um with my with all my identity markers to think wow only 25 years because there's been like so many poets that as we said were not seen not heard um or but mm -hmm. i mean could have been celebrating its 75th anniversary its 100th anniversary i mean it you know like just but again that's the systems, um, that's the systems in place. So um, again, anytime we can share, I'm also reminded when what you were saying before um, that in May, when we had our conversation with the three generations mm -hmm. of Asian American women poets, it was you know, Mary Awishi, Tanya Kohong, and Janice Miritikani, who sadly passed away um, in July. It was one of her last appearances actually. And we didn't know that. Um, but I was thinking so much about what they were talking about. And I, the resonance of, of what you're talking about in terms of community and being able to, um, it's not just the poetry that holds the community. It's the pe it's the people, and it's the it's mm -hmm. it's it's the people being together against the odds of being able to be together. Um, and so I want to, you know, thank the three of you for not only bringing your own work, but the work of so many other poets that folks, if you have not heard of them before. You now have a vast, vast, vast catalog of resources and of tremendous poetry. Um, if you cannot buy individual collections um, in 
the, in the past few years, um, there are incredible, incredible anthologies. Um, Kevin Young just published um, published 250 years of African American poetry. There's um, maybe we will put on cultivating voices live poetry. Um, I can print publish some of the names of some anthologies. You also um, can check out so that you can get the poetry um, not just of these three remarkable members of cultivating voices, but many of the poets whose names were meant were 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 said, uh, evoked and brought forward today. Mm -hmm. Thanks to everybody. Um, I don't know, do you each have maybe a final question or a final thought for today before we close out and I let everyone give you their huge kudos for sharing your work? Um, I wanna say as the selection this, this past year for the uh, uh, Fort Townsend Writers Conference that I, I get a chance to kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of shape what happens in that conference now, and so I'm looking forward to to bring those some of those voices that we don't see that we don't hear, you know, into that conference and stuff, and see if I can work towards towards um just the exposure of these writers and stuff, you know, just doing something to bring in different people and stuff. So I think like we're on the, we're at this point now during the pandemic where we kind of like that. And like, um, when I watched you start this, it, it kind of put me right there, right there. This is the time for all that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, this is the time for, this is the time. This is the time. Beautiful. My final thought would be to everyone on here, I think most of the people on this are poets and writers, is all we have is truth. Keep writing. I know. And my final thought would just, I mean, I, I had to really narrow it, you could see, because, and that's just the poets, right? But I also am a reader. I like all kinds. It's really about celebrating every day and celebrate based on all yeah. the different interconnections, because there's so many of them, whatever ways one wants to do it, we're all so interconnected. And it's really celebrating that, though, is celebrate poetry and celebrate writing and being a reader or, or, or an author, which whatever, it, it's all interrelated. Not just in February, every even three hundred. Not just in February. Yeah. That's <laughs> that's right. Every day, every day, pick up one of these, pick up these poems every single day. Uh, yeah, not just in February. I, 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 you know, we always like to do something, but of course, y'all have been not just with us in February, and it's really, really important. Mm -hmm. Again, like I, you know, I think of. I think of this in terms of, I say this also oh, like so to, during pride. I was like, yeah, it's not just June, you know, it's it's right kind of every day, right? right? So uh, a great reminder, every day is a day for poetry that, that celebrates African-American, Asian-American, the, 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 the different nationalities of poetry that we've seen here on Cultivating Voices. Each, each one is a prism into, mm. um, into is, is a side of a prism into the human experience. And as it says, it's, it holds both the joy and the grief. Uh, always. Um, that's, I think that's what makes for poetry. Well, everyone, would you please unmute and thank, show your appreciation today for Yeva Johnson, Martina McGowan, and Gary Lilly for mm -hmm. just bringing so much forward to our program. Thank As you. They always do. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. 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 Beautiful. Marvelous. Beautiful. Right. Wow. 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 Wonderful. Wow. Wonderful. So awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, well everyone, thank you for spending your afternoon 
with or your evening or your early morning with us and for this celebration of love to the second power. I can attest to that we brought that to many more powers forward with um, the work of our three poets today, Yeva Johnson, Martin McGowan, and get Gary Lilly also bringing forth um, the work of the poets they choose, that they chose to amplify. Um, and I encourage you to, to, to not only check out their own work, but the work of those poets that were mentioned uh, today, uh, if you're not familiar with, with their work. It's uh, always an absolute honor and privilege to be able to um, amplify uh, the work of uh, poets who are those legacy poets. And there's many, 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 many more. Um, you know, maybe, maybe today as we're uh, in the final moments of the reading, maybe put in the chat today, um, you know, let's put some names of of those other legacy poets. Uh, who, who are your legacy poets? Uh, put a name of some poets in the chat as a way to, um, as a way to kind of honor and celebrate uh, those poets as well. Because as um, Gary and Yeva and Martina so aptly demonstrated, um, you know, we each come from a particular poetic uh, legacy and um, and the more that we um, are aware of that, uh, the, you know, the more that we can continue to multiply our understanding of the human experience um, through, through time and the connections that each of us make as we, um, as we grapple with not only the present, but how, how the present has been informed by that past so that we can write toward the future that, that we are seeking to experience with one another across all of our differences um, and, and be able to celebrate them because we are in community with each other in, in a real way. And poetry is a, is a, is a, is a great connector. So on that note, I hope you will join us next week to connect again. Um, I believe that next week we're headed to our open mic reading. Uh, we'll be on the site and confirming that with you all uh, at same time as usual. Uh, and I shall be joining you back from back in the Pacific Northwest, back in my home with all my books. I was thinking that uh, I usually uh, have on my shelf behind me in my room uh, where I broadcast from. I usually, you usually see a, um, Audre Lorde, Sister Outsider. And I was thinking that my Pat Parker copy of Jonestown and other poems was right would usually be was usually right behind me on my shelf where I keep a few poetry books, uh, and I was sad that I couldn't kind of pull them out and show you the covers while I while um, while uh, Yeva was uh, was sharing Pat's and Audra's work today. Well, my friends, thanks again for your um, being part of this uh, celebration. Uh, it's during here in the States, uh, Black History Month, but uh, every day is a day to uh, acknowledge uh, the histories of one another. So as we said, do not relegate things to just this month. Um, and just as next month is Women's History Month, do not relegate just to the month 
that uh, gets designated on the calendar. It's been my great joy to be with you today and to hear this powerful, powerful work. Uh, thanks again to Gary and Martina and Yeva for bringing the, the poetry of music and the music of poetry. And also thanks to Don Krieger and Kim Ports Parson for bringing the program to all of us today and each week. And as I always close out with um, encouraging you to you know, be safe out there, take very good care of your beloveds. And of course, in that effort to and that necessity to be seen, to be heard, uh, to be known, to, um, to not be, to break that silence of the whereabouts unknown. Keep writing your remarkable poems and we'll see you next time. Be well. <laughs>